Team, Gaiji on the left pathway, face to the north with sword and sacred sword. I shall concentrate and convoke to thee under the sacred names of the winds, the symbol of the blackened earth, the symbol of water, the thy symbol of winter. O oh, spirits above, O oh, spirits of air, I light thy candles red. The dragon sky is sunset, and the waters are distilled. In the name of the great Patanus, set the bird is born to the ground. This is the sign in 726 elements of Azuru, dragon of the watch for Gandaya.
Yeah! There we are. God damn it. Hey, Francisco, when are you going to have somebody from Absu on? Hey, Francisco, when are you going to have fucking, you know, Proscript or Equitant, Shafty on? Well, here's the fucking day, God damn it. You've been asking for it. Here it is. So tell everybody to come hang out. Uh, check out the show. Uh, really excited for this one, as you can tell. Uh, been working on this for a while, so I'm glad these two gentlemen are here to join us today to talk about all kinds of shit today with you guys yeah i even cleaned up for the fucking show man so um anyhow uh, i'm gonna keep the intro fucking short because you guys aren't here to see me uh <laughs> yeah got a fancy haircut for absolute goddamn right uh so but anyway uh what listen to all right so hey guys i'm gonna try to keep up with the fucking comments uh uh, you know, obviously I miss, I'm a one man show here. I'm running everything. So if I miss your comment, hey, you know, don't get fucking butthurt about it. Cause I, uh, I, I can, I tend to miss a lot of them, but you can always keep putting them on there and make sure I see them. So anyway, enough of that. This is episode 38, 30 fucking eight. Can't believe it. Uh, thanks everybody for hanging out again. Tell everybody to come, come check out the show. It's on live on YouTube. And also if you're friends with me on Facebook, you can check it out there. Frazier will get butthurt. That's a goddamn truth. So, anyhow, all right. So, uh, these two gentlemen don't need any introduction, but I'm going to give them one anyway. Something off the top of my head. I, I said it in the description for the video. These two guys have influenced, had a major impact on the Texas underground scene. Not only the Texas underground scene, but fucking worldwide scene. Uh, you know, influencing tons of bands, tons of people uh, for many fucking years now, 30 something years now. So uh, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Proscriptor McGovern and Equitant. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. It's a grandiose opportunity to uh, be speaking on your fine program. Thank you. Hell yeah. I'm gonna, the, I'm hair, gonna the haircut looks great, by the way. <laughs> use that use both of those clips as sound bites to promote this fucking episode. So I appreciate I appreciate that right off the bat. So uh again, thank you for joining me. Uh I guess to get things started, I wanted to talk about the uh the most recent Apsu Proscript of McGovern's Apsu album. Um that I guess it's been out a few months now, so <clears throat> Russ, if you could speak on like, you know, what, what it took to get that album done, kind of the creative process behind that album, uh, because uh, I think it's, I guess it's been a few months now. So what are your thoughts on, you know, how it turned out and, 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 and whatnot? Yeah, the, uh, the official release date on that album was November 26th of last year. Uh, the response has been very prosperous and prominent and... Um, Took a few years, took a few obstacles, a few tangles to untangle, retangle, and detangle more or less. But uh, switched a lot of gears, switched lineups, uh, disbanded Absu in order to formulate such a project called Proscriptor McGovern's Absu, which was actually the original moniker for the ABSU album. But um, had many aesthetic uh, alterations come into place, and um, that's all I can really reveal at the moment. So, new mm -hmm. band, new moniker, new lineup, new label, uh, everything. New logo. Yeah, new logo. <laughs> Clean the slate and uh, decide to march forward into a new direction and not look back. And um, so, there you have it. Also, now, are you, I mean, what do you, I guess, I don't know when the last, I know bands listen to recordings a ton when you're creating it and mixing it and all that. Uh, I mean, are you, are you, what are your thoughts? Are you pleased with the, the final outcome of that album? Yes, I am. Uh, actually, this is the first, and I'll actually throw this into the, the rest of the Absu discography, but this was the first album where I was in control of mixing it. 
uh, along with JT Longoria, who was uh, the engineer for the last two Absu albums. And so um, basically he started the engineering project and I wrapped it up, I completed it. So I can say um, this is the first time within three decades that uh, I was actually in 100% control of the engineering aspect of it. Oh yeah, and this is obviously the uh, cover art, which uh, I, I, I personally think it's, it's, it's fucking cool as shit. So. Who, uh, who did you, I guess, use on this for the album artwork? Uh, Polish artist Z Zbigniew Bialik. Uh, he was in charge of the, the last album as well. And um, I will say that uh, he has monopolized uh, many illustrations with many bands on a, on a worldwide basis. But uh, not only did he uh, formulate the cover illustration but he was also responsible for eight plate illustrations that are lyrically and conceptually tied to the lyrical structures within the album as well so um it's not just the cover illustration but also eight additional pieces yeah. that uh, aesthetically and magically affiliate with the lyrical conceptions of the album sweet and it's um uh... Agonia, Agonia Records. I'm, I'm guessing Correct. it's still available. So yes. if anybody hasn't got it yet, I guess can they, can they get it directly from you guys, or do they have to go to the label? Have to go through the label, unfortunately. Okay. All the complimentary copies that I acquired directly went to all of the uh, went to uh, the lineup as well as the myriad of guest musicians that participated on the yeah. album. I did notice that uh, quite a quite a list of uh, guest musicians on that. So. Well, cool. Uh, so let's, I guess, let's go way back. Something I like to ask everybody is, uh, and, and this is for you guys and or for both of you guys and, and Ray, you can, you can start first, but did you guys grow up around music in, in your house? Was there music? Were your parents musicians? Uh, can, can you speak uh, on that? No, not musicians. Um, pretty much uh, grew up with top 40 seventies, uh, radio airplay, uh, Dad was into country, soul, rock, early Beatles, um, stuff like that. Mom was into pretty much top 40. Uh, I guess first record was Waylon Jennings' uh, Music Man. Oh, wow. Due to the uh, Dukes of Hazard soundtrack. <laughs> it's a classic. Oh, yeah. And uh, then uh, all this was growing up in East Texas, pretty much, and South Texas. And then I uh, moved to Dallas in 82. Um, we had a Hastings in our neighborhood. Oh, yeah. So I picked up, you know, Shout of the Devil, uh, Number of the Beast, Power Mania. So that was the first introduction to metal, pretty much. Sweet. And then um, I knew a kid that uh, his parents were super rich. And uh, I think his dad worked for some distribution label. He, he did all kinds of records, and he one day he showed me a uh, uh, Show No Mercy. That was like we right when it came out, and I I'd never heard of it or seen them, you know. Yeah. So that was a shocker. All I could think was they look like Molly Crew a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, so I heard that eighty three ish. Uh, I guess like eighty four, eighty five. I heard uh, Frost. Um, Haunting the Chapel, because we had a lo local rec uh, radio station that played all the early metal, and of course, Ride the Lightning. Um, so that got me into, you know, the harder stuff. Yeah. And then punk rock, too. I was into, you know, Black Flag, all the classics, DRI, Minor Threat, um, all the UK stuff, Exploited, um, Discharge, stuff like that, GBH. Oh yeah, I mean, I then totally it dig all that shit. On from there, and then you know, but then then I, then I saw a Morbid Scream in '86 at the Shepton Jam High School Jam. And that oh, really, that really <laughs> changed. Me. So is, uh, is is that the photo that you sent me? Uh, same high school, different. Uh, three years later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll show that. Later. We, yeah, that we played it as a well, we were necrotic then before Dolman. Well, you know what? Let me show that anyway. With uh, Kelly and um, Martin Roth, 
and uh, Danny Benbo on drums. That bass, was that your first bass guitar? That was actually my Achilles' father's. Oh, and, wow. Um, yeah, I, I used it. He just he just messed around on it at home, you know. But uh, but yeah, I used it all the way up to Dolman, and then he even used it all the way up to, gosh, Tippereth, no, uh, Shineth. Wow. Yeah, and then he got a uh, custom BC wave bass, like Tom Horizon. And then yeah. we used that, we used that from uh, Third Storm on. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's the old red bass PV. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I can't help yeah, but notice the PV, the PV amp behind you. Yeah, that's the same one. I, we used that all the way up to uh, In the Eyes, I think. Wow. Yeah, right. I, I had several others. I had a Marshall, uh, what was it, Marshall uh, Anniversary Series, the gray one. It didn't sound as good as the PV, so I kept using the PV. Then I had an Ampeg and a few others, but yeah, that was the one all through. Wow. <laughs> That's fucking cool. Uh, yeah. I guess Russ, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. Growing up, and uh, did you grow up, you know, around music? Were your parents musicians? Or- yeah, I did. Uh, it. My story starts in 1977. My father was a guitarist. Also, I have a brother that's eight years older than me, who was also a guitar player. Um, he was uh, actually in a band, and he turned me on to. Uh, an immense amount of bands uh, growing up. Um, Blue Oyster Cult, Nazareth, April Wine, Head East, Molly Hatchet, Yes, King Crimson, Genesis, uh, Ted Nugent, uh, Moxie, uh, just a countless amount of band sticks. So, you know, I, I, I just completely disregarded and skipped any kind of toys and I went straight to vinyl collecting when I was four years old and that's how it all started. So um, my mother was divorced at the time and she actually met a gentleman by the name of Mike Hoagland, who later became my stepfather. Well, Mike uh, was from Champaign, Illinois and played in a numerous amount of bands while he was attending the university of Illinois. And Mike was also a student of both, uh, Ed Shaughnessy and um, a lot of other prominent drummers as well. So uh, once he married my stepmother in 1981, uh, both parties collaborated. Uh, we got a house and he moved all his possessions into the garage of this new home. So I started to meander and I started to piddle around in, in his belongings and I noticed these cases that were stacked up in the corner of the garage and I happened to unleash the the tops of these cases and realized that it was a uh, 1964 even though I didn't know the year or model at the time but it was a 1964 Ludwig uh, oyster pearl shelled five-piece kit with a 1960 Ludwig snare um, wow. yeah, so, um, he gave me basic lessons, taught me basic time signatures and, um, uh, I was self-taught until I was in the fifth grade, which was 1983. And that's when I, uh, I started band. I was in a concert and symphonic and jazz band from fifth grade to ninth grade. Then, uh, after ninth grade, um, I met this gentleman right here and um, decided that... Uh, 1988. Yeah, 1988. And I decided that uh, I had fulfilled my destiny with school, symphonic, concert, and jazz band and um, started to discover the Teutonic metal side of life and uh, other kinds of... Um, magical and spiritual outlets so um that's when i quit band and uh i met uh equitan here and the rest is history more or less yeah i was actually gonna ask uh that when you actually guys when you guys actually uh, officially first met but uh um now were you when were you guys involved in any musical projects when, <laughs> when you when you initially met yes uh carnage it was basically just covers with a 
Gary Lindholm, the first, first, uh, well, second, early FC guitars. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I actually met him in a park. Yeah. I had no idea who he was, but we were actually there to meet Gary, who was actually the first guitarist for Absu. Yeah. And we had no idea, so we, we, you know, happened to stumble upon one another at this park, and uh, where everyone hung out back then. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it caused chaos and havoc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we discovered that a lot of our uh, euphonic and musical similarities were very much alike. And so Gary, Ray, and myself, uh, we had formed a band called Carnage with a K. And the next band was Carry On with a K for the, yeah. love of, for the K being uh, for the love of creator at the time. Right, right. So, um, yeah, those are the first two musical outfits that uh, those yeah, are the, those are the seeds that were planted into what would later become Absu. Yeah. Uh, Ray, you want to add anything to that? Oh, it was just, you know, at that time, all we really knew were covers or trying to know covers. Um, Creators. What was some, what was stuff like oh, that. Okay. okay. And this was 88, 88, 88, 89, right? Yeah, around there, yeah. Yeah, 1988. spring and summer of 1988, to be exact. I think, I think we tried to rehearse at Gary's house, but that f failed, I forget. And then we went to my house, which Magus later rehearsed there as well. My mother rent the room to them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess uh, when you guys were, you know, starting off initially forming bands, getting playing <laughs> covers, uh, were there any, uh, were you were you attending local shows? Were there any bands that, you know, in the local Dallas-Fort Worth area that kind of inspired you to, to to get going or, or you know, maybe international bands? Yeah, for me, that, the, the, for that first Morbid Scream show I, I saw, that's when I knew I wanted to do what they were doing. But um, I really... What other early shows? I don't know. Um, Rigor Mortis, of course. Right. Um, I heard them live on uh, KNON, the public radio show in Dallas, and blown away, of course. Yeah. And they yeah. Play, play Rigor Mortis, Rigor Mortis, Morbid Scream, Talon, Sedition mm -hmm. were definitely the most prominent uh, local heroes at the time. Mm hmm. Yeah. For so I. Speaking, yes. I mean, anybody that knows the, the history of, uh, of the band knows that you did the two Morbid Scream covers. So, uh, you know, it's pretty evident that they did have an impact on you guys. So, oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, with the uh, coming of War and Morbid Scream. But uh, so I guess after the carnage carry on, the, the cover <laughs> stuff, you guys, I guess you kind of formed separate bands correct mm -hmm. yeah yeah we'd met danny and um he had a, a rehearsal space in his house once again because back then that's all there was, was was houses you know a few people would rent uh public storage you know storage places. yeah 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 in fact i saw morbid scream at there's on a very hot summer texas day but uh back then there was no professional rehearsal spaces so it, yeah. Of course, was in houses, but uh, so yeah, we just we got together with Danny and started jamming, and me, Mike, and uh, Martin, and um, just formed Dolman, Rusted Osiris, and yeah. um, just went on from there. Is is there a reason you guys kind of I guess didn't form a band like? kind of went your separate ways at that time or since you were already kind of doing things together? Oh, I don't know. I think it was, I don't know. I don't even remember, honestly. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so the story goes. Okay, what you must remember. We, we, when <laughs> Carry On was around, we painstakingly tried to locate uh, a storage or I'm sorry, yeah. a personal yeah. facility but um, not having the, the luxury or the accessibility to rehearse in a house, um, we actually attempted to look for storage units in order to rehearse, and um, it, it just wasn't feasible enough. So 
that's when Danny and Martin came into play because they were previously in the band and then they had uh, coincided with both Ray and Mike. Right. And so they kind of, you know, let left me in the shadows, but that was fine because that actually gave me an apt amount of time to. Yeah. Cause uh, you came back. Uh, yeah. Discover, back discover myself as a drummer, discover my drumming, learning new techniques and whatnot. So um, yeah. So I was basically just uh, practicing on an individual basis up until I formed um, the band Osirist, which was in 1990. At that time, um, uh, there was Dolman and Necrotic and Azathoth, those three bands under those monikers before the Absu moniker was settled in was early 91, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So was this the first, I guess, official like release uh, of, 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 I guess, your projects, the Dolman? Stuff. Oh, it, it, it was never official. I, I, I just, <clears throat> I'd gone through old tapes in '94, as it says in there, and uh, just released it as a, you know, a, a demo. Technically, it was never a demo; it was just a rehearsal. Right. But um, and then uh, Costa from Iron Pegasus, I think I'd sent it to him. He's like, "I want to release this," so <laughs> I was like, "All right." <laughs> we so we did. Yeah. That but no, it was never official. No. We just had tons of rehearsal tapes, you know, yeah. like well, you, jam box recordings, basically. Yeah, you mentioned Osiris. That was, uh, I guess it's kind of a obscure band, I guess, if you will, that uh, you or us were involved in. Is that was that uh, was that something that was officially released? And uh, I know I asked you about it recently. I mean, I, I don't know if that's anything that's going to see the light, you know, see a, some kind of official reissue or anything these days. No, I mean, the only release that was ever issued was a demonstration effort called Themes of Intessusception, um, and it was recorded with a, uh, a tabletop recorder, oh. uh, heavily influenced by Carcass, Carbonized, Righteous Pigs, bands of that nature at the time. Um, a lyrical concept was based on uh, pathology, disease, medical terminologies you know yeah. it was uh, an intriguing subjects to be delving in at that particular time so yeah um so yeah there was a three song demo and um osiris disbanded and that's when uh magus was spawned with the same guitarist uh martin roth who was previously in the dolman so well, we were well, one. We were one big community the communion that was uh, swapping members and alternating. <laughs> members. Yeah, yeah, left and right. Oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say like uh, like carcass pathology type lyrics because there's only a few bands that like have made me like reach for a dictionary, or, you know, whatever encyclopedia, and it was carcass, bad religion, and absu. So it's it kind it kind of ties in. To where, you know, because obviously your lyrical content isn't, you know, it's not just, you know, your old, like, metal style of, like, you know, well, you know, whatever, like early Slayer or anything like that. So yeah. uh, I find yeah. it interesting that, you know, because those were, like, the three bands that made me, like, I don't know what the fuck this means, you know. So yeah. let me, uh, let me, let me delve further into this. That way I know what I'm, I know what I'm screaming while I'm, you know, listening to it or whatever. So, um uh, here's a well, here, you know, I guess I, I do like to involve the, the the people in the chat. So here's a, here, actually here's a good question. Do you guys have any stories about Mike Scassia that you'd like to share? Uh, Mike Kelly would because they rehearsed at an hourly rehearsal where we used to rehearse, and he he was the man, manager. Yeah. But um, I honestly don't. Um, I saw him. Yeah. I really don't either. I mean, I, I've ran into him on several occasions. I didn't yeah. personally know him. I mean, we shook hands and said, hey, and bye and whatnot. But as far as rigor mortis, I was uh, much tighter with Bruce and Casey Orr versus Harden and Mike Scotia. Yeah. So I personally don't have any uh, in-depth, intricate stories relating to him. The other two aforementioned members, yes, but not uh, not Mike, even though he's... He was a 
an extraordinaire on the uh, the six string mechanism. Quite the guitar player. Quite the yeah. uh, immense and colossal uh, speed techniques that he had. Just uh, an an astounding player. Big uh, big influence on Shaftiel for sure. Yes, yes, huge. Well, actually, if you if you watch Shaftiel's like guitar picking style, it's it's very similar. Yeah. So, I did get to uh, see him in '88. The original lineup was Slayer, but that's <clears> really the only story you know I have. It was always like, wild that they they amazing signed to Capitol Records. That just always blew my mind. You know. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So, all right, moving on. So, uh, going through these uh, with your old rehearsals early on, uh, the return to the agent, and something something uh, that I noticed that you did was there was always alternate covers. Was there a reason for that or, or, or uh, like the logos would, you know, would change somewhat, uh, but there, there was always alternate covers. Is that because it was like a different, different I don't know the reason. I, I just wanted several and probably got bored with a few of them, but uh, <laughs> that, that's probably the first one, the very first, first one due yeah. to the old, old uh, logo. And I mean, you know, uh, I, th I think you're, you know, rather well known for uh, for your artwork. Uh, I, what kind of who influenced you to 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 start drawing, to pick up a pen and pencil or whatever to start drawing? Oh, um, gosh, I mean, early days, the usual Geiger, of course, but uh, um, well, early days, Pusshead for sure. <clears throat> really. And, um, but other than that, none really. Just uh, from the mind, I guess, basically. Yeah. And uh, here we go. Let me show another one here. This was uh, the, the the actual demo, uh, Temples of Oval. Yeah, that was um, an alternate cover again that uh, Brian yeah. Ar Arwick did for uh, Ishnagar. And... Um, I might have had three other alternates with the with the uh, <clears throat> figure rising out of the abyss, basically. Yeah, there was there was several for this one. I know that. <laughs> yeah, but that was just one he did. That was eh, wasn't too important. <laughs> yeah, here's the because he he was actually selling it along with me <clears throat> separately. So yeah, here's here's another one I'd like to show. At the uh, time of the uh, the seven inch, or before, yeah, yeah, the black version, right? I reversed that one. Uh, do you have any memories of recording this, this demo? Yeah, yeah, it was at the uh, early version of Nomad, which was a very small. It was like an office building, basically. <clears throat> so the control room was in one room, and you'd walk down a little bit, little ways, and the actual recording room was in another room. So you couldn't see the engineer at all. It was all, you know, headphones. But um, it sounded great though for for that for that time. Super clean, super clear, and we did everything in one take. You know, that was it, all together. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, let's move on to. I guess I wanted to just kind of capture a little bit of the of the, the earlier. Somebody <clears throat> mentioned a while ago. Uh, the let me see, let me pull it up, see if uh Russ wants to share any any stories on this. The Magus uh recording, uh, I don't know if you'd like to share some, uh, oh, yeah. if you have any memories about the recording this and which was done there, there as well in Nomad, yeah. So, uh, Magus at the time was only around for. A grand total of six months duration time speaking um yeah so um and actually six months and we only performed six shows total as well so that um actually before that recording at the very first performance which was in it was january 10th of 1992 at joe's garage in fort worth um <clears throat> we um, recorded the show on soundboard and that is, that was later released as bonus tracks uh, for the CD version. 
and also um, the LP version of this, and also uh, On the Eve of War, which is a concoction of both Dolman and Megas together that the Crypt released several years back. Anyway, so that was the unofficial first demo, but this was the second demo uh, recorded in March of 1992 at Nomad, and um, it was kind of a disaster at the beginning because I believe... We recorded the entire demo, but uh, the guitars were tuned to something ridiculously low, like A or B. It was oh, extremely on. low. And anyway, um, the engineer at the time, Mike Smith, uh, he wasn't very, let's say he wasn't, he didn't have a vast knowledge base in extreme metal music. And uh, he wasn't able to, uh, sonically pick up such low guitar tuning. So anyway, the end result, it was very muddy, it was very turbid. There was no uh, distinction as far as the rhythm lines were concerned. So I came up with the solution and said, the next day, let's go ahead and re-record the entire demo, which consisted of four songs. But yeah, you know, you guys need to tune up. And I think they tuned up to see <laughs> a little bit, a little bit uh, yeah a little bit better but uh, i think that's what ended up uh, it was c standard c tuning on that recording so yeah. uh, so uh i disbanded magus in the latter part of may but um yeah well before i get to the next part of that story so disbanded magus in the latter part of may and officially joined absu which um, both Shaftiel and Equitant were um, uh, hounding me to, to join several months back. And I wanted to, but I was already uh, knee deep into the activities of Megas. So I, I officially joined Absu on June 10th, 1992. And then that, the, the Megas demo actually evolved into a seven inch on Gothic records, which was released in October of the same year, 1992. So there you have it. That's it. Yeah. The, uh, actually, uh, both, uh, the absolute and the Mag Magus were released, uh, on the, by the same label, which was, Correct. Uh, which was, uh, uh, Gothic records, uh, mm -hmm. Enrique, who was in, uh, sedition. Shana. Yeah, Enrique Chavez was in Sadistic Intent, for those that uh, may not know. Uh, he actually put out some 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 really good stuff back then. I thought, like, EPs and went and, and like, uh, he did the Zemio, the first Zemio 7-inch, which is fucking outstanding. And, uh, yeah, uh, the sleeping. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I, actually, I was going to ask that about how, how you uh, ended up joining absu you said it was may 92 i believe you said june uh, june, june 92 june 10th to be precise did you wow yeah, yeah. so um did did you have to did they run you through a rigorous tryout or anything like that or is that you're in the fucking band how did it go no there were no, no. requisites because i was previously <laughs> in two bands carnage and carry on with them in 88 and 89 so and plus, during Absu rehearsals, when Danny would sneak off and take a break, I would get behind the drums and say, uh, "This, this is how it's done, boys." <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you mentioned this to me before. How your first show with the band was Fourth of July '92, so you were officially in the band for like a month or less than a month, and you you did your first first gig with them. Yeah, well, I mean, I was already, I was extremely familiar with the material, so, uh, which consisted of the three songs from the Temples of a Fall 7-inch, and uh, they also had other songs, which would later evolve into the remaining material that would fill up the uh, the song roster on Barathrum Vitriol, so uh, I think we played a total of... Uh, six songs at the first show on 4th of July. It was also at Joe's Garage, and it was a nightmare. It was a total disaster, man. It was just, uh, you know, first of all, booking a show on a on a uh, major holiday for the U.S., it was just, the, the attendance was low. 
The attendance was, was shoddy. It was feeble. Uh, our distinct, distinctively remember Gary uh, had technical issues with his head. He was cutting in and out. Yeah, I bet he did. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so eighty the remaining 80% of the performance was ended up being uh, one guitar, bass, and drums. And monitor mix was... It was disoriented. It was just a mess. Total mess. <laughs> Sounds like a typical first first fucking show. Yeah. But yeah. Before <laughs> that, we had finally gotten our first rehearsal room. So yeah, that changed everything. So yeah. Well, you uh, speaking of Joe's garage, all the all the flyers that were passed out and you know through the mail and all that seemed like the majority of the shows in that area were at Joe's garage. Was that was that the the underground venue back then? Pretty much, yeah. Uh, national and international, yeah, everyone everyone played there. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, yeah, it was the prominent venue at the time. Then it started it started to gradually seep into the Dallas area. So um, the basement in Dallas, Dallas City Limits. And a few other smaller places, but um, the yeah. galaxy. Uh, yeah. Later on. yeah, then it started to slowly seep into the deep Ellum region. But um, oh, yeah. yeah, late eighties, early nineties, hands down, no questions asked. It was definitely Joe's Garage. It was the most prominent venue at that particular time. Yeah, it was like the uh, in Houston we had the Axiom, so I would, you know you always see flyers for that. But uh, so oh, yeah. Joe's Gar Gar Joe's Garage was actually a mechanics uh, shop, or is, 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 I believe it was a restaurant in the seventies, right? Yeah, it was. So. Oh, okay, and then they just good. built a stage into it. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then obviously the the venue was named after the Frank Zappa album. So yeah, there you have it. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean it's it's you know every every town has that you know legendary venue, and it seems like Joe's Garage was that for 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 that area. Yeah, we saw uh, so so many so many acts there. It's a great place for the time. Yeah, and I guess that's where Morbid Scream would play a lot, right? Oh yeah, yeah, Morbid Scream, Brick and Mortis uh, sometimes. There were more that well. Theater Gallery was another old one too. Uh, scream! I'm sorry, Rigger played there a lot. No. They're yeah. it was mainly a punk punk uh, venue, but they would play there. Hell yeah! Uh, what? Some. Also, I wanted to show this because I always there's like certain addresses that like over the years that like stick in your head. I hope, <laughs> I don't know who lives there now, but. Topaz Way is like one of those addresses that like you know, some it's forever life. like ingrained in my head, you know. So yeah, uh, I don't know who lives there now. So if you live there and, and, and maybe people <laughs> might watch this, you know. So hey, yeah, that, that was the, uh, that in a uh, Mission Ridge. Those were the two main uh, mail hubs for many many years mm -hmm. in the days that we did constant mail daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's. I just want to that just Topaz Way just was one of those, yeah. one of those addresses that always stuck in my head. Uh, so, well, I guess we touched a little bit about Gothic. What? How did how did the the releases kind of? How did you get in touch with Enrique, or did he get in touch with you? Like for both bands, how how did that happen? Uh, gosh, I might have written him. Honestly, I don't remember so long ago. Um, yeah. And he heard it immediately wanted to do a seven inch. So we, of course, agreed. We had a few little small distributions, but um, with just the demo. And then, uh, of course, he did that and uh, many variants over the years. Oh, those early years, he did red, purple, swirls, black, all kinds. Yeah. And he did, uh, we'll get into this. He released the the first official release. Yeah, was on yeah. Gothic for the for the uh, for the debut album. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you've mentioned. I think you've mentioned to me that there was. I know there's like different covers even early on because there was issues with the with yeah the many printing, many right? different versions. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if you care to speak on that. Uh, uh, 
uh, about about well you know actually let, let's let's talk about recording this because this is yeah you know uh i guess for both of you what uh what you have any you know fond memories of recording this was it was it a pleasant recording or did you guys struggle or you know could, could you share a little bit about that no yeah, we were pretty pretty well rehearsed um and it was recorded in several places, starting with the drums, correct? Yeah. Yeah, let me rewind a bit. Uh, so when I obtained my copy, my complimentary copies of Ruminations of Debauchery 7-inch from Enrique, I informed Enrique by phone that the band had disbanded and I had joined Absu, and he immediately... Uh, sparked interest in issuing a full-length album for Atsu. And so um, discussed it with both um, Mike and Ray at the time. And um, let me pause right there. So Gary was uh, dismissed from the band. And at that time, uh, Dave Ward, who was in Magus, we recruited him to be in Absu, so he contributed on Barath from Vitriol as well, and then Brian, aka Black Massive, he was the uh, the keyboardist who was also uh, who also participated on the debut album as well. Right. Um, so anyway, we were officially signed to Gothic Records for the debut uh, album, one album only. And as far as the recording goes, uh, it was recorded. It it started in March of nineteen ninety three. And the drums were recorded in Flower Mound, Texas. And it was actually, it was a converted storage shed that was, uh, that was metamorphosized into a drum tracking room. Very professional, very tricked out in a very immaculate way. Yeah. So drums were recorded in a storage shed, more or less. And then everything was uh, transferred over to the engineer's house, uh, Danny Brown, in Garland, Texas at the time. And um, it was one inch, and then it was submixed twice on half inch tape in order to grant us a total of 24 tracks. So uh, there were six reels total two one inch and four half inch tapes wow yeah but i mean uh yeah it was a very uh smooth process uh we really liked the way that it that it turned out and um yeah it was a it was a very prosperous time this would be Man, danny brown correct smooth. yeah Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Danny uh, was responsible for working with Sedition, Talon, Rigor Mortis, Solitude, who later evolved into Solitude Eternus. Um, actually worked with uh, worked on Paul McCartney's live album. Uh, very, he was a sound live sound engineer, um, but was one of the most uh, prominent engineering figures in Dallas at the time, and is still engineering to this day. Well, yeah, I, th I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's his resume is rather impressive with like yeah. the, the, the bands that he's actually worked with and recorded. So, uh, uh, I think Ray had mentioned like this laundry list of like I was like, wow, I, I had no idea, you know, that uh, things that he had worked on or been involved with. So, uh, so it's good that I guess that he had worked with Talon and and, and the previous bands you mentioned because I guess that made it he actually understood how to get how to get sounds from you guys right yeah well um what happened in 1992 divine eve recorded their four song demo before it was metamorphosized into an ep uh on nuclear blast a year later um we heard the recording completely impressed and enthralled by the overall production of it uh, I acquired Danny's number. I had talked and consulted with him. And at the time, Divine Eve had recorded with Danny at a studio called Sound Logic um, outside of Dallas. So I contacted Danny and said, Hey, you know, we want, we want to record our debut album at Sound Logic. And he said, Well, 
I'll engineer it, but it's not going to be at Sound Logic. So he uh, <clears throat> he uh, terminated his position as engineer at that studio and said, I have a better idea. You can save money and we can spend a lot more time if we track and mix the album at my home studio. So um, we agreed to it and I knew he was a pioneer in engineering. And um, so drums were recorded in the storage shed in Flower Mound, Texas, and everything else was was tracked at Danny's house in Garland, Texas. Was that a good in night? Garage, basically, yeah. Good night uh, studios. That was for Son of Taparit. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, we'll get we'll get to that. But uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, that, but I mean that album, uh, the 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 debut album. Um, yeah, I, I think. Sonically, I think uh, I mean I, I I really like the album. I love the album, but sonically, I think it's it's it sounds really fucking good. So uh, I've always thought that uh, about that album. Uh, let me share a couple of so that uh, in that time, you know, there's there's like iconic band photos that come, you know, that bands take, and I, he, I uh, to me easily this is this is one of those one of those band photos. Uh, I don't know what you guys thought about it at the time when this was taken, but uh, I'm sure you've I'm sure you've probably heard it, uh, you know, plenty of times over that just this photo and it's just it's just one of those photos that just like I said iconic to me anyway. So what where was this? Do you guys remember like where was this taken or or was it a session or or what's the story behind the photo? Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Was it Bland? Was that one? Yeah, Bland? yeah, okay. yeah. James, James Bland. Took yeah, it. James Bland. He was a notorious uh, music photographer in Dallas, um, and our manager at the time, Robert Evans. She insisted that we only have a top shelf photographer actually capture the band. So uh, he had a studio in Dallas, and uh, we shot it there, and. Uh, there was actually another session during the same time, which was shot on the side of a building which housed an, an occult bookstore called Lucia's. Uh, uh -huh. Some people may have seen it, but the Egyptian High of Horus is painted on the outside of this building. So he thought it would be some spectacular, spectacular idea to shoot on the side of this, uh, this bookstore. And it, it turned out well, but I mean, as far as layouts and press, uh, those particular shots were never utilized until, you know, years and years later when, uh, yeah, for awesome three issues and box sets were, were issued. So, yeah, but James was, a. Uh, <laughs> of course it became, it became the actual cover art for the Osmos release. Yeah, exactly. I never want to see that photo again. <laughs> It's available online. What do you want to yeah, that, that, Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that. That is the first session when the the quintet actually formulated and became as one. So uh, you know, still well, I, still experimenting with the with the guy liner and the the makeup and the guy liner, the, the, the black metal ways of life, more or less. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got to. Uh, uh, same with, my, with Carrie, which I think both of you guys know. Uh, Roberta, I, we actually got to meet her. I think she was really cool. She was your manager for 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 years on back then. So uh, yeah, uh, she was she was real. She was a nice lady. I got yeah. to meet her. I think I think we met her once. So, uh, but yeah, so yeah, I, I I know you felt so strongly about that photo. <laughs> oh, it's um, all right. It, it, it's been seen. Well, I, I personally haven't seen it in a decade yeah. or so, so I try yeah. to I mean, it. It, it's it's publicly out there, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's publicly displayed. I'm just uh, yeah. Well, this this gentleman wants he's asked this like three four times already. Uh, story how the original artwork got lost in the mail for that okay. for the Israel album. May may I narrate here? Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. The album was released on Gothic, and uh, having a discussion with Enrique Chavez, he told me that uh, he was going to receive uh, distribution and European European licensing from Osmos Productions. Well, at the time, 
uh, Osmos Productions was the leading innovative pioneering label for this new second wave spawn of, of black metal. And uh, we were, you know, very, very excited about it and very enthralled. And um, so a couple of months later, I received a call at 3 a.m. And it was Hervé Herbeau of, of Osmos Productions. And he told me that uh, he was not pleased working with, uh, with Gothic Records and wanted to actually, at the, the initial plan was to distribute gothic's product but later come to find out Hervé had come up with the idea to uh, license it and do uh, a printing on osmos productions so to make a long story short he was painstakingly trying to acquire the original queen of disc artwork from enrique and um, there was uh, delays and postponements trying to get it over to him um, Finally, the, the artwork, which was actually shot down into a color slide negative, uh, Enrique had for, informed me that it was successfully mailed, but um, it wasn't. It, it was either mailed and it got lost or it wasn't mailed altogether. I don't know the conclusion. Mystery. Anyway, uh, Hervé from Osmos in, uh, I believe it was, Early October of 1993, he had contacted me and said, well, you know, we have a deadline uh, to have this released on December 1st of 1993 because SPV was our distribution team at the time. So we have no choice but to use that particular band photograph as the cover. And um yeah. I, I was pretty irate about this because I knew that... Uh, Immortal was to release Pure Holocaust on the same date, and they had a black and white a cover, yeah. photograph represent their front cover <clears throat> representation as well. So yeah. we looked like uh, we didn't want to look like posers, you know. We didn't want to look like replicators, yeah. duplicators, and you know we spent Ray and my myself had spent a long time. Uh, you know, putting putting the ideas and the the mental formulation together for this Queen of Discover, and then to not be utilized, uh, it, it was a little disheartening, more or less. Anyway, so it was released with the band photograph cover, and then uh, Rick and Bay Quartet, <clears throat> the sadistic intent, actually took over Gothic Records, changing the name to Dark Realm Records. They finally reissued the album with the proper Queen of Disc cover illustration. And they, they did an immaculately good job in, in releasing it. So, and then later on down the road, um, Osmos reissued it with the original cover. So yeah. it all turned out. Yeah, in the end. For the best, yeah. <clears throat> but at first it was, there were a lot of obstacles, definitely. I uh, One quick note about Osmos. Osmos had, at, at that time, like, you know, early '90s to mid '90s had all the all the premier bands uh, at that time, but I always didn't like. And may, maybe you guys can answer this: that they didn't include like inserts on any of the vinyl versions. I don't know what, why that was, but all my early Osmo stuff doesn't. All it is is the, the jacket and the, the the vinyl, and that was it. I don't know if there was that was a money thing or what. Do you guys was that ever? Was there ever talks about including inserts and everything on the early albums? Oh, I don't know. Probably, you know, young, young label, or, you know, not young, but new label. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just one of those well, pet peeves of mine. Yeah, I mean, the, the first pressing of Bathroom Vitriol, it didn't have an insert. It had just a paper sleeve. And as a matter of fact, some people, some individuals know, others might not know, but that press, the, the labels are swapped. So side A is actually, and theoretically, is side B and vice versa. I'm sure mine's like actually that. before I, I, before I, before the initial spin of the actual record, I looked at the label, I looked at the song titles, and then I scrutinized the grooves and I called both Ray and Mike and I said, uh, We got a problem. Yeah, we have a, we have a <laughs> manufacturing flaw here. So, oh, shit. Uh, then, then finally, uh, 
Osmos uh, made an upgrade and started to include eight and a half by 11 Xerox copies of uh, their lyrics. So mm-hmm. no, no glossy inserts just yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But close. Yeah, but close. Yeah. Yeah, that was an attempt made at least. Uh, but yeah, I was just always, this is a pet peeve of mine. I was like, I, I don't fucking get it. I just, uh, why that was. But I'm going to have to look at my, I'm sure, I mean, mine's the, the, the original pressing or something, but uh, I'm going to have to look at that. I don't know why I've never looked at the labels. But anyhow. All right, cool. Uh, oh, I wanted to talk about this. These these are some cool photos uh, from, I guess this was your rehearsal room. When, uh, from Where was this rehearsal room at? Yes, that was uh, rehearsal room one, we called it, because it was the first one. And then our second one was literally feet away from that one. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, and that's uh, Gary's Warlock there in B.C., <clears throat> I think I was borrowing it. I don't even remember. Can't remember. Uh, yeah, no. But yeah, that's the, uh, that's the Iron Bird there. Got a <clears> piece. 85 uh, bolt on active BMGs. Uh, I got it at a place called Zoo Music, which was a really old music store in Dallas. Yeah. I've been there since like the 70s, probably. But they, you'd walk in and they would, there was rows of guitars like laying on on each other because they wanted to to display them all but they were laying on each other in rows all the cases were in the back basically so i walked in there like an episode of hoarders i mean you walk in it's just stacks and floods and deluges of just guitars on top of insane it was an upstairs as well for drums yeah and um so i saw it in the I think I got it for 350. I went and asked the guy if there was a case. He was like, no case. So I walked out of there with no case for 350 in 92, I think. Yeah, 92. And I've checked recently in that that same model. It's an NJ. It goes for crazy money now, over a thousand. Yeah. So what happened? I sold it long ago. Yeah, and what about the the the, the white BC guitar? The white the white shells kit. I know you can barely see it here, but uh. Where, where did that drum kit end up? White Pearl? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I actually bought that from a drummer who practiced uh, adjacent from us. It was a uh, guy by the name of Mike Tuttle. He played in this kind of uh, glam, hard rock band. Good drummer, actually. But uh, that drum kit, it was a, a nine-piece Pearl export. And apparently it was used by uh, Buddy Miles, of, uh, who played with Hendrix and the Band of Gypsies. Uh, he used that kit on several occasions for uh, clinics. So I bought the kit from him for $500. And actually, he was uh, generous enough to work out a, playment, a payment plan with me. So that was, uh, that was extremely generous of him. So I used that kit on uh, Barathrum. Son of Teparit and uh, the EP and Shineth and To the Cold Cometh. And I actually sold that drum set to my ex girlfriend's younger brother. Oh, wow. For, for $1,200. So I profited $700 off that kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, recorded a, uh, you know, a couple of decent yeah. records on the way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, somebody brought. So we'll, we'll move on from this era, but I got to bring. Uh, somebody brought it up. The the when you guys recorded, this is the actual uh, location of the video. Right? Oh yeah, it's it's back a, then. It's a, it's a church in Fort Worth. It was built in what was it, eighteen fifties? Maybe I forget. Uh, yeah, eighteen fifty six, I believe. It's basically, it's basically just the shell of it left. Yeah, so it's gutted out completely, except for the. Uh, exterior yeah. portion of it yeah so th- yeah. that uh so it was i guess it was kind of it wasn't really a common thing for bands to like record like a video i guess so you know it wasn't gonna be pe- well i don't know maybe in europe maybe it appeared on mtv europe or something like that but uh what what was the i guess why did you guys decide to record a video uh for that track back then uh well that was 
that was the uh, the the marketing strategy idea uh, derived from our manager Roberta Evans at the time. The director oh. Jeff Williams, who actually uh, filmed and and basically collaborated the whole project together. He worked with Roberta at the time, so Roberta consulted with us and said that uh, that she worked with this gentleman who actually does video work and production on the side. And um, so we gave him a few ideas, but he wasn't able to transpose the lyrical content properly into the actual footage. So um, a lot of it was- it really uh, wasn't what we wanted. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't. And we spent way too much time uh, it, it, putting it together more or less. I mean, it, there was just a lot of time spent for the outcome that we didn't totally perceive. Was but, it intentionally grainy? Yeah, it was actually shot on uh, Betamax tape. Okay. And then uh, transferred to VHS. So it was uh, intentionally grainy, but uh, okay. it has. Um, it's almost like it, it was shot in slow frames, so it's very it's very stagnant. It's very there's a lot of there's latency from beginning to end throughout the entire video, and so you just have to close that chapter in video production and uh, move on <laughs> move to on. <laughs> on to the next. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. You actually, well, it wasn't until what uh, two thousand no ninety eight. 99. 99. 99 that you, you recorded on, but yeah, so yeah. yeah. All right, so moving on now. The the, the next album uh, saw a little, you know, somewhat of a change in the 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 the, the musical writing. You know, it was a lot of speed German thrash influences in it, uh, which obviously goes. You guys were doing that, you know, with Dolman back in '89. And mm -hmm. it's actually some of the Dolan riffs, for those of you that may not know, ended up in Apsu songs uh, years later. I think Never Blow Out the Eastern Candle is yeah. one of the songs that featured riffs from Dolman. So, uh, you know, a lot of people's like, well, you know, they kind of, you know, how do you go from this to that? But you guys were actually doing that previously. So mm -hmm. uh, now this album kind of opened, I guess, kind of opened a lot of doors for you guys. There was tours. There was uh, the now infamous uh, was it sex, cyber, and rock and roll tour? I believe it was called. I can't remember. Yeah. But uh, now, I love the sound on this. I know you guys like uh, ended up like uh, remixing it or remastering uh, here with the past few years. But I always like the warm sound of this of this recording, uh, especially the drums. It just it sounded to me. It sounded like seventies style drum recording to me. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but uh, talk a little bit about the recording process of, of this album. Well, the mixing board was from the 70s to start with, so that helped, you know, analog. Um, and, yeah, you can tell by the drums, the warm the warm sound. Totally did it. Guitars, too. And this was uh, also, this was at good, uh, good Night Studios, right? Yeah, and Reel to Reel. Okay, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. You, did you guys ever like record anything in the, in one studio? Or was it always like, <laughs> you know, at, at, during the year? Once we got the Nomad, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. But the, the, the first two were, yeah, scattered. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, seems it would make it a little more difficult to me, but I, mean, I don't know. But uh, but uh, I guess, Russ, uh, 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 I mean, you, you, you remix it, remaster it, so obviously you wanted a a little different sound on it. I mean, what do, what do you uh, what are your thoughts on the sound, like the uh, original uh, mix of this album? Oh it, well, first of all, I mean uh, the the tracking of the drums. It's it's very. It has a lot of girth. It's very thunderous. It's very menacing. Very malevolent. Uh, but at the time, and I think I can speak for the other members that we weren't a hundred percent blissful. With the uh, with the the total outcome of it, um, 
felt like guitars were buried. Guitars were slightly out of tune. Yeah, uh, and, and the tone of the guitars. Yeah, just a lot of uh, a lot of um, principal distinction was actually missing in the original mix. Um, but overall, I mean, the actual the, the capture of the audible essence was definitely there. So, uh, you know, at that time in 94, 95, actually 95 when it was released. And I, I told both Mike and Ray, I said, this really needs to be remixed someday. And that that, that actually applied with the next album, Third Storm of Kudro as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it it's not that... Uh, I was intentionally trying to set out to to erase history or whatnot, but it's just those partic those two particular particular albums were not sonically captured the way that they should have been at the time. I wouldn't touch the first album. I wouldn't touch Terra. I wouldn't touch any of the other albums within the discography. But those two, because the songs are so important, that's why they had the the remix. Uh, sheen actually added to them yeah well on third storm i think i think it i feel com completely opposite i think it sounds way better than than the original because the original the guitars were like sounded muddy and the, the drums to me yeah. anyway to my ears uh but if you yeah. if you listen mid range like, yeah you can actually hear riffs like on the on the, uh, yeah. the remastered version uh the drums, I, I, I think, I think that one sounds above and beyond uh, better than the uh, than the original. I know everybody, oh, original, original. Nah, you know, if it sounds better, it sounds better. Uh, so sure. at least that's my opinion. Uh, yeah, the way that I classify the original mix, it was it was too breezy. It had too much air in it. It didn't have enough dynamics that were locked down within it, um, and. I will say this, a lot of people do not know this, but I actually used four different snare drums trying to get a different uh, essence of a different uh, different s snare tonality. And, and we used different cabinets, different guitars. It was just different. There, there was too, too much experimentation, and we used an engineer that had never recorded metal before. He was like a punk alternative guy mm. that, that engineered the album. He was falling asleep on the job. It was just a mess. It was just a. It was just a, a tangle. Anyway, we got through it. We remixed it. And... <laughs> we got through it. That's yeah. that's that's a good way. To, good. But way it to does go. sound a lot better. I actually yeah. listened to it through headphones the other night. I had not done that, and it it sounds so much better the so, way it should have should have been. Yeah. I think uh, we should... now the EP. Uh, the and Shineth EP to me that that one sound sounded sounded great. Uh, you know the the original recording that was was that was that recorded? I can't remember whether was that recorded also at a or was that when you first went into Nomad? I can't remember. Yes, and and that was the first digital recording as well. No, it's prenatal productions. Oh, prenatal. Oh, okay, yeah, because there was there was a there was a studio on the second floor of our rehearsal studio. So it was oh, China, yes, China. Yes. Yeah, so it was recorded uh, a very small studio on the second level, like I said, and uh, those two songs were tracked on a one-inch tape, 16-track, and um, yeah. So Third Storm was actually the first time to record a full length at Nomad Recording Studios. So Nomad was responsible for Third Storm all the way up to actually – this very last album that was just released. Yeah. In essence, more or less. Sorry, In the Eyes was the first digital. That was it. Yeah. 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 Well, that one's, to me, that one sounds just uh, amazing. Didn't King Diamond recorded at Nomad, right? Am I, am I, am I, am I incorrect in that, in saying and, that? Yeah. Thought... And, Mer and Merciful Fate as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, so, all right. Uh, so we covered those, just trying to briefly cover the albums uh, and the recordings. Now, when you guys, uh, I, I can't believe nobody's asked in the chat, but uh, who approached you guys to to do the song for the Gummo soundtrack? Shall I? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I had a friend at the time. Her name was Spider. She lived in New York, and she was very good friends with the director Harmony Karen at the time. And she, uh, we used to talk a lot on the phone. She had a, a cable access show for for metal in New York at the time. She also could, she was also a contributing writer and journalist for uh, several magazines, one in particular, which was kind of a notorious called Seconds. And she had her own fanzine as well. Anyway, she called me and said, you know, I'm friends with Harmony. You're familiar with the film Kids, correct? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, he's formulating this new movie called Gummo. And um, would you be interested in contributing a song to it? And she told me some of the bands that were going to be participating in the soundtrack. And she said, you know, just think about it, run it by the others. I'm going to send you the script to the movie. And I said, okay. So the next week I acquired the script, the script to the movie. And uh, <laughs> wow, I, I just didn't know how to, to psychologically wow. paint that picture. I didn't psychologically know how to, how to compose uh, something based on Thelemic magic or Sumerian or Celtic mythology, uh, yeah. uh, you know, about this tap dancing mom, you know, I just, I, I didn't know how to, how to perceive it. So we just disregarded the script altogether and came <laughs> up with the song, the gold torques of Uli, which uh, Ray was the, uh, the chief lyricist for that band. And, uh, but initially we thought, the song might be in the tornado scene, right? Yeah, well, yeah. it was it was proposed that the song was going to roll during the opening credits of the movie. And I actually went to a premiere of it in Austin in 1997, sat through the whole movie, and, uh, you know, the song wasn't on there. Of course, it was featured on the, the, the official soundtrack, but was right. not featured in the movies whatsoever, so... Great movie though, twisted, yeah. demented. I remember watching it. Understatement, but uh, yeah. I mean, the only reason I watched it because the soundtrack. I'm like, at the time, it was like you know, absolute mystifier. And whoever else was on the on the, uh, I can't remember the act. Everybody else on it, but uh, I, I remember watching it. I'm like, what the what the fuck am I watching? You know. So, uh, but that song, I mean, top three. Fucking absolute songs for me of all time. Oh, that, song, very much. that song, uh, the BPMs picked up on that recording for absolute. I think that's that was kind of like a turning point where things started getting faster to me. Mm -hmm. uh, because that song just came in. I mean, right away, it's nonstop, just fucking, you know, I, I for lack of a better way to describe it, it just punches you from, from the beginning. And it's like, it was just, it was just like, I was like, oh, fuck. And I remember, I remember seeing you guys. Play it, I guess it was the first time you played it live on that the, in Arlington before you went off on the uh, the tour, the '97 tour, and I was like, Yeah, oh, it was included. Yeah, yeah, I was like, Holy shit! But uh, that that yeah. album, that song is easily top three for me uh, from the band's uh, discography. But uh, and and I do remember me and my buddy Carrie like hearing it. It's like, Holy fuck, dude! We were just like over and over and over just listening to the fucking song, <laughs> uh, which. Nowadays, I hardly do <laughs> with, with anything, you know, because yeah. uh, you're constantly bombarded with like new stuff all the time. It's like, you know, you don't have time to like digest albums anymore, it seems. I mean, I guess you can if you actually make the time to do it, but there's just so much things coming at you, uh, you know, from all, all corners. And uh, it, that's kind of lost, I think, in, in, uh, in like music listening these days. But, uh, but yeah, that was that was that was always cool to me. Uh, and then uh, it picked up the the speed picked up even more on the uh, on the eye in the eyes EP. And I'm not going to say the, the last word because I'll, I'll butcher it completely. But I think it's Ildana, <laughs> Ildana or something like that. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> see what happens. See what happens when you do your uh, you do your research. You know, yeah. I was like watching some interviews, and I I I kind of remember you pronouncing it like that. So that is uh, it. And I learned that it's not Tifereth, it's Tapara, I think you just said. Tapara. Tapara, okay, okay. Yeah, so it's it's Hebrew, and it's uh, 
all the H's are silent, so it's Tibaret. So it's Hebrew. And also with Egyptian language, so like T H O T H, people just assume it's Thoth. Yeah. No, the H's are silent, so it's Tot. There you go. That's your uh, that's your foreign linguistics lang uh, lesson for the day. There you go. You're you're not gonna get this type of fucking content anywhere else, uh, <laughs> boys and girls. You can learn this shit here, and uh, I, and I mentioned it like promoting this show. This was the first time you guys have like been involved in anything uh, like this, so uh, it's cool to be like you know first one that you guys do this with. So uh, no, thank you very much. Great uh, experience. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, now. So in the eyes of Aldana, it's got well, uh, and I guess this is more for you, Rust. I, I don't know if you watch videos of people covering your songs, uh, especially that one. There's there's several of people trying to cover that song, but mm -hmm. the the uh, that's one of those Absu songs that's like everybody always talks about, and and, and uh, the my, my, I don't want to pronounce it my my my, my new I, I don't know how to say it my new moon it's the M -A -N -A. Noon. So ma noon noon just like twelve o'clock. <laughs> ma double up on the noons. That's yeah. it. Yeah. We're, I'm learning. I'm learning today. So, but uh, the there's 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 videos of people trying to cover it. Yeah, some people you know they they make an attempt. But uh, uh, so I was going to ask you, do you watch any of the cover videos of of, of your of your songs? Yeah, I haven't in quite some time, but uh, yeah, I've seen a few. Yeah, I think I've I've been able to to view the majority of them more or less. But yeah, it's not none of them are a hundred percent there. It's just because I have this fusion progressive rock jazz flair to my playing, and I just I play with a lot of quarterals and a lot of just. Uh, paradiddles and a, a lot of quarter rolls, which are like ghost notes. I've played with a ton, an immaculate, endless amount of ghost notes and quarter rolls. So those are solely missed when I see these uh, replicated videos of my playing. But I mean, there's some that drummers that they've nailed it, except for the quarter rolls. No, oh, there you go. But, so but that's like <laughs> I said. I mean that that's my signature flavor. So. If they yeah. don't replicate it, but at least the majority of the patterns and the beats are, are prominently there. So that's what's most important. Yeah, because that, that one, I think that's the one that I've seen uh, that people try to to cover quite often. So uh, mm -hmm. it's just, and there's like videos. Well, I'll, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll lead into this. Uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of drummers, percussionists, usually like in the back and, you know, whatever, they, uh, you know, just keeping the beat. But like later on, like, I guess in the more recent times, I guess, when you go to an Apsu show, everybody's kind of fixated on, on you playing. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, how uh, you, you might be too into, into the performance or whatever, but it's kind of like you're, even though you're in the back, you're kind of in the front. So uh which i kind of i kind of i'm a, a guilty of doing that myself or watching you um uh, so i mean how does how, do you even notice uh kind of that happening around you when i'm singing and playing simultaneously no because i mean it's just it's total wreaking havoc and it's a, just a whirlwind of just malevolent chaos and, and thundering madness that's happening on a simultaneous basis. But when I'm taking a, a vocal break while drumming and the other co-vocalist is, it, it's their time to be executing the, the vocal delivery, then I actually have a chance to spectate and look at the audience. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll catch some eyes here and there, but when I'm singing and playing simultaneously, uh, it's just my equilibrium is completely off. It's just a total, it's a total storm of dizziness, more or less. <laughs> uh, well, I, I call you, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of lost, I guess, nowadays, but you, you kind of still, you still kind of do it. 
uh, you, you actually put on a show. You're a showman. Like to me, you're a showman on stage. You're you're trying to put on a show. It's it's theatrical to me at, at points. Uh, what is what is that? What does that influence come from? For, you know, for your stage performances. Well, um, you know, I've I've always wanted to be a, a, a drummer, and I've always wanted to be a drummer since the age of four when I first started collecting vinyl and records in 1977. But at the same time. I always wanted to be a vocalist, and that's why I uh, doubled up on the duties to be a drumming vocalist simultaneously. And then, you know, the past few years, I've had a secondary drummer come in and uh, take over the throne while I front the band uh, vocally in a, in a live atmosphere. But uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest influences for me is uh, old Genesis because I've always been a, an in, influenced and inspired by the theatrics of Peter Gabriel, but at the same time, uh, the drumming of Phil Collins. And after Gabriel left and after the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway album, uh, Phil Collins actually became the singing drummer. So he would drum and then get up and then have a secondary drummer fill in they would have two drummers and then he would front the band so it's kind of this equal hybrid fusion balance of, of peter gabriel and phil collins phil collins being uh, one of the biggest percussive influences of my playing uh i have to owe uh an immense amount to to genesis for uh putting me where i am today yeah, I mean, because like I said, no, most bands and, and a lot of performers are just standing there playing, you yeah. know, playing the songs. But you always added that 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 showmanship to 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 the to the live shows, which I've always I've always thought was cool. So, uh, 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 was that? Oh, so getting back to to the album now, uh, Terra, right? Is uh, I guess the last the last album uh, Ray was involved in. Now that uh, I guess that's you guys started including like guests, guest musicians on that, and you know there's some stories out there about who who did what and all that. But the one the one guy that always stood out for me was the guy that did the uh, uh, the more like I don't know how to what how maybe Dio esque type vocals, and I think it's was it uh, Ronnie it was Ronnie Trent is that right? Yeah. And he was in a band called uh, Ten Kingdoms, That's if I correct. remember correctly, which was fucking amazing. Uh, if if nobody's ever heard Ten Kingdoms, uh, fucking check it out. He's the guy that does the uh, the the uh, I don't know what 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 type of vocal delivery would you guys uh, call that? But he, that guy just stood out to me on that on that fucking album, uh, on that on that song, which oh, yeah. is like an epic epic song. It's like another one of those top fucking absolute songs uh, for me. But uh, so I, I just just want to throw it out there about that guy because that guy's fucking unreal. Uh, now recording that album, uh, which sounds great, also was also at no uh, at Nomad. Uh, things got a little more, I guess maybe progress. I know you, Russ, you're there's no secret you're into progressive progressive music, but to me that's when the progressive influences seem to kind of be highlighted even more with the length of the songs and, and the riffing and all that. Uh, you guys care to uh, talk about that, recording that album and putting it together. Yeah. So Terra is a concept album. And uh, at that time, consulting with Mike, AKA shaft deal, uh, we knew that previous material was just becoming faster and faster and within our characters, the playing and the, the composition or compositions and arrangements were becoming a lot faster and a lot more technical and aggressive as well. So, um, the the main objective was to really outdo ourselves and i you know i i have to admit i i do feel it's probably my best drum performance out of any album 
Oh wow! But, but everyone is is completely different. It's like you know, Son of Tapar. It's a very laid back, percussive album, but at the same time, uh, Terra is very fast and furious and uh, definitely my fastest feet work to date. I will say that. Um, but the goal has always been to never uh, duplicate nor replicate the same album twice within the discography. So uh, uh, Arrows, um, it's a milestone within the, the discography and I'm extremely proud of it. I think I think you kind of you kind of nailed it. Terra sounds like a never-ending drum solo. I think that's it's kind of a decent way to describe it because yeah, it's it like much is. <laughs> it is. that's a pretty good way to describe it. Uh, Alberto, I, 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 he I, he's obviously a, an absolute like avid absolute fan because he's been like just commenting uh, like things that you know only like a crazy absolute fan would uh, would would know about. Uh, did you switch to it? Oh, you know, let, let's get into the, the I guess, the your your drums, your gear. Uh, did you switch? Did you do anything different? Any new, uh, like, you hadn't used on that recording as far as kick pedals? Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. So after I sold the nine-piece white export, I obtained an eight-piece Pearl Prestige Session Select. It was a burgundy wine shell color. It was a seven ply birch wood. And um, there was only one kick drum used. Uh, I used that particular drum kit on Eldana and Terra. I ordered a secondary bass drum for it. And uh, it took it took me almost two years to successfully obtain it because uh, Pearl didn't have any of the same finish or the same uh, five ply birch shells in the country. So it was actually made in Japan. It was finally shipped over by boat. And when I went to go pick it up at Guitar Center in 1999, so this was actually in between Ildana, the recordings of Ildana and Tara. And when I went to pick it up, um, the sales representative went to retrieve it. I heard this loud crashing clamor of sound. And he came back to the register with his hands in his face and said, I dropped the snare drum. It completely cracked in half. So, oh, wow. yeah. So I've kind of gone back and forth by using uh, two kicks versus a single kick with a double pedal. So, um Ildana and Tara were with a single kick uh, with a double pedal. And at that time, I was playing uh, Iron Cobras for both those recordings. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ray, what uh, uh, what gear, what did you use? Because like uh, in Ildana, I know you and I have talked about it, and, and Tara, the, the guitar tones sound, uh, sound crisp, sound... Sound, sound yeah, yeah. Nice I was, was going to say at, at that point, um, like Russ said, the stuff had gotten so technical and so precise, mainly because of Mike's writing, that I pretty much gave up guitar and just went went back to bass because I had to. Because <laughs> Mike was so perfect, it was impossible to record as precise as he was getting at that time. So by in the eyes, it was just bass. I we'd started rehearsals with me on guitar, but then once studio time came, I just went to bass. But uh, for that one, he used uh, a Fat Boy, which was a local company. I think they were based in Chicago, but uh, then maybe moved to Dallas, I forget. But he, but that's what he used on that, which I thought was a great sound. It's heavy, beefy, but, um, and then uh, Tara was uh, basically the pod. No, no amps whatsoever, and I went direct basically. Oh wow! And no distortion, so that that changed. That made a lot more clarity for one thing, because I think we'd lost it in previous ones. Yeah, you know, just due to mic placement, EQ, everything. So once we hit. Ildana and Tara, it was really, you could hear everything way more better. 
Yeah, the main objective was to kind of back back down off the 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 drive and the gain on the guitars to That's pick true. every yeah. picking note, every all distinctions. It was extremely important. It was extremely crucial to capture every note on that album because mm -hmm. it had been lacking within previous albums in the discography. We didn't want any mud, not, no, no crap, no nothing whatsoever. It had to be not clean, but distinct. And that was the main objective. And, and the uh, tone to more, more, more well. mid range. That's, that's what we were always lacking is the mid range. So yeah. that was brought up a lot, I think. Yeah. But, uh, so we got the mid, so we got the mid, we were able to successfully obtain the mid range on that album. But we yeah. had to make a sacrifice, and we lost low end in the final mix. That too. Um, yeah. So it's a little, it's a little unbassy, more or less. But oh well. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's not one you're going to remaster, though. You said or no. remix or whatever. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I guess in was it mid '90s to early 2000s, there was seemed to be a lot of like. Uh, tribute kind of recordings uh and i you got i know you guys did the uh the maiden one uh, which somebody's brought up so that's why i was asking uh recording uh what were some of the other ones i think i can't remember mayhem, all. mayhem that's right because the acts destruction because there was uh, supposed to be a lot of people may not remember but i think even osmos may have even put it out for an ad out for it, it was supposed to be like a covers thing called Thrash Storms, yeah. like ninety five or so, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, it was supposed to be uh, a a cousin release that was supposed to coincide and come out simultaneously with the third storm of Kudrul. But at the time, we noticed that uh, a good amount of Osmos bands on the roster were also releasing companion cover EPs at the same time. Uh, Bewitched was one. Marduk was one. Uh, Impelled Nazarene was another one. There's three bands right there that were already doing it. Uh, I think Swordmaster was intended to do one. But anyway, we scrapped it uh, and it never happened. So uh, we had... You know, Death Crush and Swing of the Axe by Possessed, uh, also intended for it, were um, Bestial Invasion by Destruction, Ravenous Medicine by Voivod, because we were supposed to be on a Voivod tribute that Relapse Records was going to release back in the day. That fell through. Flag uh, of Hate. Flag of Hate, uh, Divis de Mortis, Necrovore, uh, possibility of um, Necronomicon by Sacrifice, uh, Whiskey Time by Bulldozer. So those were candidates right there. And yeah, you know, but we just decided to fold it, tuck it away, shelve it, and, and just solely concentrate on original composed music. Yeah, Swing of the Axe, the uh, the Metal Massacre version is far superior. Correct. Yeah, it is. <laughs> then uh, Eyes of Horror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, oh yeah, but uh, uh, my friend JD had asked about specifically about the uh, the Maiden cover track. He says he likes it better than the uh, than the actual Maiden one. But uh, where did you guys record those at? Was it at 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 uh, at um, no was Man. it all at, at Good Night or wherever or Nomad? Yeah, it was at Nomad. Uh, oh. Cole Marshall, who engineered uh, Eldana and Terra, was responsible for that. As a matter of fact, that's the first project that we worked with, uh, including Cole. And uh, the individual responsible for the guitar solos is a guy slash friend by the name of Joseph Ellis, who's the guitar player for King Ten Kingdoms with Ronnie Trent. So he plays the, the solos on that particular song. Wow. And we decided that it would be most logically wise to record a uh, an instrumental versus a a Deano or Dickinson song because I didn't want to I didn't want to taint it. I didn't want to taint it with extreme vocals uh 
in this, you know, I didn't want to replicate Paul Diano or Bruce Dickinson's vocal with some extreme metal voice. So that was the reason why we chose uh, the instrumental of Trans Transylvania. Yeah, I wish more bands would uh, would 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 have done the same thing because I've heard cover songs with like it's, it's just it's just it just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> so not saying yours wouldn't have, but I've heard some before where it's like, ugh. Yeah. You know, don't do that, please. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, just if you would share if there's anything that comes to mind off this tour, like I know having to having to tour with those two bands, I'm sure there was. Chaos. Plenty of plenty of things that uh, you remember that happened. Chaos, like as you said. Uh, <laughs> any 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 stories you each of you'd like to that remember? Like first thing that pops in your mind when you when you think about this tour. Safety pins, piss, <laughs> semen, more <laughs> semen, more safety pins, <laughs> more, Chris, more Chris, urine. Chris getting ready for the show and uh, putting the safety pins in. <laughs> like, like a bunch. It's crazy. Uh, safety pins. I mean, oh, I mean, I mean uh, yeah, Mister. Uh, what what Ray was pertaining to? Oh, he he, he would put safety pins uh, in his skin, basically like a line of them on his arm and all the uh, way. Up. Yeah, over a hundred, and they yeah. were fresh piercings pre-show, so he wasn't exactly. utilizing the same piercings with the the safety pins each and every night they were new piercings. So by the, by the end of the tour, you know, we're talking like 2000 micro dotted scabs all over the sky. <laughs> it's very impressive. <laughs> and then of course he had the, he had the custom Ibanez, you know, the, that he made himself basically. Yeah. You know, points and very void So that, that was really cool to see. He'd even like route out the, uh, the neck where the where the frets are is crazy. Yeah. Uh, well, when I had uh, uh, Chris Mazatarus gamble on here, he uh, he mentioned a fight on a bus, I believe, like between like uh, I think it was Rock and some uh, maybe Dave Slave. I don't I don't remember who else. But, yeah. Uh, that was uh, I think he said uh, one of you guys was like trapped, like kind of right there or couldn't get out. I, I, I can't remember right offhand, but. No, and I, I and I, I distinctively remember Chris narrating the story, and he 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 didn't paint the picture properly. So this is what happened. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it was. Um, so the tour was a total of thirteen shows, and ten out of the thirteen, it, it was the tenth show and the last one for Impel Nazarene. So the last three performances were to be shows uh, 11, 12, and 13, uh, Rome, or actually in this order, Torino, Rome, and Bad Warfish in Germany. So the last show was in Germany. It was show number 10, and Pell Nazarene's last gig. Um, come to find out that um, six days before the tour that Dave Slave was released from some mental institution before the tour, which was fine, they're all great blokes, all great guys. Um, so anyway, that particular show, um, he was handing out, he had a roll of uh, silver foiled sadistic execution stickers on a roll, and he was handing them out to people. And I remember he handed a few of them out to uh, the members of this German band called Eminence. And yeah. they kind of threw them down on the ground, said, oh, you know, sadistic, you're not true black metal and you're not drinking the proper beer and what you, your band sucks, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this really this this emotionally distraughted Dave Slave and he didn't drink. So this night he drank a lot of whiskey. And while we left the venue and we were on the bus, um, he Cruising just down the highway. Yeah, going down the highway, uh, he, he just he lost it. He mentally just snapped. He had a, a major meltdown. He took my hand. He took my left hand and tried to basically eat my pinky. He tried to bite my finger off, <laughs> Holy and shit. he almost successfully did. So I had, to, I had to, like, pry his mouth open. Then Rock and Chris Hades saw the havoc and, and turmoil that was going on. And uh, they just started pulverizing him. 
and there was a table upstairs in the lounge area that was bolted down to the ground. It was ripped out. Uh, Chris Hades was beating him so relentlessly that he broke his hand and his fingers in like five to six different places. Had to play three shows after that. Um, the tour manager, Johan, at the time, realized all the, the scuffling and chaos that was occurring on the second level of the bus. Uh, yeah. Stopped the bus and basically said, I'm you know, I'm going to pull over at the next gas station and dropping you guys off. You can find your own way back to Australia. <laughs> like, <"Whoa>. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So I, 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 just I, one, one more story real quick. That yeah, I, yeah, a lot, a lot of down please, and everything was cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was great. I mean, the, wonderful band. They're just, they're just phenomenal and they're, they're cult legends. They're just, they're pioneers. They're mental. They just create the tour. They're, with. They're, yeah. They're utter legends anyway. So one story that a lot of individuals don't know about is <laughs> we, <laughs> during the show in Berlin, um, I'm watching sadistic execution and I look and Chris Hades is playing, but he's wearing a, walkman headphones and he's got like a sony walkman that's attached to the the belt of his leather pants <laughs> and after the show uh we were sadistic and absu alternated opening and mid slot because impel nazarene always headlined every night so that particular night um sadistic opened and we were second while impel was obviously headlining so after the show i approached chris and said i noticed that you were wearing a uh a, a headset with headphones during your show and he was, he was like yeah man he was like i was listening to king diamond then the entire time <laughs> while playing our show he's like I, I didn't even listen to our show it's just listening to king diamond the entire time oh, wow and, he also, and i watched the entire sadistic gig and it was phenomenal it was oh, wow so yeah very impressive <laughs> yeah i'll say no yeah, oh, great, man. great shows yeah. Well, that guy's an amazing uh, fucking bass player. Uh, oh, yeah. He's incredible. Yeah. That's one thing that gets lost with that band. Everybody sees, like, the, you know, the image and whatnot, but those guys could fucking play. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, right a great time. it was a great tour. Yeah. Good memories. Now, this show, I know you got, I think you guys played uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest twice, I think 95 and 97. But I, I put I pulled this one up just because Venom Venom played it, and I think that was like the first time Venom ever played. I think the U.S. If I if I, if, if if I'm remembering uh, the, re, the re, reunited Venom. Yeah. The reunited. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The reunited. Yeah, yeah. That was like the first reunited. Yeah, exactly. Uh, show yeah. or whatever. We got to see uh, him too. Of course, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask any memories of, of playing this show and possibly uh, or you know of this fest. Uh, yeah. well, Her it was. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Hervey had came to see, to see it, and he actually filmed it too. We we yeah. yet to ever see his copy of the, the filming, but. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was cool. It was much better than 1995, which was yeah. just a, an audible disaster. Oh. Yeah, but anyway, um. Yeah, the set was cut short. Anyway, 97 was much better. It was a much better Milwaukee Metal Fest, if I can safely say that. But, yeah, I mean, Venom was great, and uh, SOD was awesome. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good experience. Yeah, I bet. Uh, well, I want to share this real quick because uh, Chris, when he was on there, he talked about – I think this is, the, this is the actual show. It was in San Luis Potosi in 97. And how like rabid the people were there, and yeah. I think I think this is the uh, I, it's a little short clip I put together or I didn't put together, but that I uh, cut down from what I, I saw on, on YouTube. But uh, just to kind of uh, give the the even the video gives off like this intense vibe for what for for uh, for that show. So let's check it out. <laughs>
right. So uh, I, think, I think almost the entire song is, is on YouTube. But the, the, whoever the guy that was filming it, he's like literally like in your face, like everyone. Is oh yeah, he was he was all over the place <laughs> the entire time, and just the energy that's captured on that video is like. It's 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 intense. So, uh, what's that? Uh, and I know I, I I think Ray, you may have uh, you and I have spoken on that. But uh, uh, what what I guess I want to hear your 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 uh, perspectives from that show because I said Chris gave his. So uh, Ray, I guess uh, you can go first. Yeah, it was it was insane. We I think pre-show we got there and um, somehow I ended up in the crowd and we all got separated basically with just autographs and in a sea of people, basically. And, uh, but yeah, when it, when it started, it was just, it was just chaos. People everywhere. It was yeah, it looks one of the, one of the first semi outside shows we'd done too. It was like an awning above us, but that was really it. It was outside. <laughs> yeah. And just it was of course rented gear. You know, very small amps. Yeah. Problems. So the sound wasn't that great, but um, but yeah, we played we played well and kicked ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then when when it all ended, um, everyone just rushed rushed the stage basically. So we basically had to run run to the backstage. <laughs> wow. And jump like off the stage onto concrete with our guitars, and then run around. And then Russ can narrate what happened to him. <laughs> okay, so this particular excursion, uh, I requested to the tour manager to rent a microphone headset from a backline company per city in Mexico, with San Luis Potosi being the last one. Uh, they were they were unable to successfully. Uh, provide me with a, a, a microphone they tried. So uh, one of the stage hands handed me a, uh, it, it wasn't a headset microphone, but it was a, it was a fiber optic, like telemarketers phone <laughs> headset. So I asked, I was like, do you have the, uh, do you have the, the number pad and the, you know, the phone jack for this? How, where, do, where do I hook up? <laughs> Uh, there wasn't, it was a, a yellow, dilapidated, rotted wood drum throne. It wasn't even a drum throne. It was like a, a like a, 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 a stool for like a potted plant. Uh, the, the drum set was co uh, compiled out of uh, like four different drum sets together. Oh, um, before the show, going on the stage, each member had four personal security slash bodyguards. When he was talking about uh, going on the way back, when I was going on the way back to the so-called quote unquote green room, at the time I had 16 earrings. All 16 were ripped out. My earlobes were, were bleeding. bleeding. Uh, yeah, it's just my earlobes were just mm -hmm. shredded shredded total flesh holy shit yeah and uh i will say that's the uh i really like to name drop this show because uh <laughs> it's the it's the first time that i've ever seen a myriad of women crying hysterically just to get backstage just to meet the band i mean in tears wow. like, yeah it was like beatles territory it was absolutely bonkers <laughs> man bonkers yeah. Yeah, absolute mania. Yeah, <laughs> that's wild. Anyway. I mean, I, I've 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 played it. I've played a couple of gigs in Mexico, and it, you know, as far as the gear, I just I laugh because you know, you, yeah, some of the stuff we had to play on. I was like, uh, okay, yeah, you I mean, know, you do what I you get, you do what you have to do, right? But it's yeah. just like, I think in San Luis, I played out of like a Roland, some Roland, little cabinet, like a like a PV is weird. Yeah. yeah, we played at a, a – me and my buddy always – there was an amp – a company – I think the brand was Smarvo or something like that. I don't even know what it was. I'm like, this is what we're fucking playing out of. But, you know, you, you're there. You might as well – you, you got you to gotta fucking do it. Yeah, but, you uh, do, do what you got to do. <laughs> but, yeah, that's cool. I mean, the fucking uh, – the uh, 
crying fans and yeah. Well, I guess that what is. I mean, I've heard many bands that have toured all over the world. Usually, like uh, uh, Latin America is usually the most rabid fans. Is that is that is that been what you guys ex- have experienced? Uh, Italy, maybe, but uh, yeah, South America for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, South America. Yeah, I mean, just the Latin portion of the Western Hemisphere, from yeah. little above the equator, southbound, south of the equator, just pure, pure maniacal chaos. Definitely, Colombia is absolutely insane. Mexico has always been insane. Um, parts of Brazil. Yeah, for the majority, uh, definitely Mexico and so- all of South America that uh, I've personally played in um, have been maniacal but very prosperous at the same time. Yeah. Have you uh, have you played Chile? Yes, twice. I've always heard, like, insane stories about bands playing in Chile. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so there's, uh, let me go. I have tons of things that we're not going to get to, but uh, I wanted to share. Let me, where did, where did, oh, I guess, I guess, I guess just to show the photo, but this was interesting to me that uh, Absu was on a BC Rich ad with like Slash and, and, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, who else is on there? I don't even know who that is. Is that Max Caballera or something like that? And uh, and, the, and there's Jeff Cook, the guitarist from Alabama, right above. Oh yeah, you. yeah, there he is, right above you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this was always uh, Ray. I don't know if you uh, can shed a you know brief little story about how this came about. I know. Uh, I mean, I guess the the BC Ritz whole BC Ritz thing. Yeah, M- Mike had gotten to be good, you know, really close with him. Uh, with junior, I think, I think senior, but, um, cause he had, of course, several customs that he got in the nineties. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess he got, you know, kind of sponsored by him a little, I mean, pretty much. I just thought it was interesting that everybody else is like single and they put like the band photo on there. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, why, I don't know why, who made that decision, but, uh, <laughs> that's, that's yeah, strange. That's yeah. Kind of, Pretty, pretty hilarious. But no, uh, it, was, it was cool. It was, it was an honor because God, we'd used BC Rich since day one, you know, since '88. So it was, yeah. it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess now I'm just gonna just drop a couple of photos that I, I wanted to get. Uh, I, Russ, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but my friend uh, Brad from the band Morgue sent me this. This is of you in the uh, I think 1993. At uh, yeah. it was the incantation autopsy show, I guess absolute was on. It's kind of kind of blurry or whatever, but I don't know if you've ever seen that photo. I've never seen that photo until I had neither, I, yeah. but I specifically remember the moment because, yeah, oh, really? We, yeah, because uh, we opened up for them and uh, vital remains and autopsy incantation was on the tour, but at that particular show, it was at Joe's Garage as well, and uh, Incantation were um, unable to to make uh, that show. And then they, that, that tour was actually playing Dallas the following night, uh, but Incantation wasn't there. But yes, uh, I do remember. Yeah, so thanks. I, but I've never seen that photo before until now. <laughs> That's cool. So thanks, yeah. thanks to Brad because his band was on that tour. With yeah, more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. That was that was uh, cool of him to share that. So nice. I'll I'll send that to you. you know, yeah, thank you. Appreciate uh, it. To uh, to check it. Oh, there we go. Uh, that was an accident. Uh, oh, something else. I guess I can show you now. Yeah. Something you don't see much anymore is like tickets. So there was uh, <laughs> like tickets for shows anymore. Like actual tickets. This one this one stood out just because the lineup. Uh, uh, Gamma side, you guys played like after Gamma side, which was I don't know, I don't know if Gamma side was were they I don't know I don't know how active they were around this time 91, 92 or something. Yeah, I think it was 90, 92. 92, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that show happened thirty eight days. I can't believe I remember this. It happened thirty eight <laughs> days before I joined Absu, 
Yeah. That was the second to the last show with Danny on drums. And I was there and it's the best Absu show I've seen that I didn't play. That oh. was <laughs> yeah, because the venue it was uh, that uh, TMA Dallas showcase was held at Dallas City Limits, which was an outstanding venue. Yeah, really uh, nice. Yeah, the front of house sound was just it was flawless, spotless, very good. Yeah, very good show. Now I take that back. This is the third to the last show. I had to make myself a correction there, but yeah, third to the last show. Cool story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Pete Brown. I think Pete Brown might know you guys, but yeah, because he he's been. Yeah. Uh, it's, apparently, it's a strip club now. Oh, yeah. cool. Aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, they all. <laughs> yeah, they all turn into strip clubs. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying that uh, it's a bad thing no, or a good thing, but I'm just saying. Um, oh, here's a cool photo. Uh, this. Where was uh, this yeah. at? Oh yeah. Uh, that was taken in uh, 2010, and um, my ex-wife, business colleague, um, basically, I it was in two, it was in the late spring of 2010, and my ex-wife said, "Do you want to go to a party for this girl that I work with?" And I said, "Yeah." She's like. At first, I was reluctant about it, and I said, yeah, I'll go. So I went to the party. Uh, the bar was actually outside in the patio area, and I opened the door, and there he was. He was like, Russ. I was like, Ken. He is. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it was cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, hell yeah, that's awesome. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start winding it down. So if anybody has any questions, anything, I mean, there's so much to cover. Uh, that obviously I'm going to, you know, we're not going to be able to cover everything, but we're going to start winding this down. So if anybody has any burning fucking questions they they, they need to get off, then uh, go ahead and put them in the chat now uh, while I'll show a couple more photos uh, from, now uh, here's a cool one of, of you, Ray. I guess this was around, uh, do you remember where this was? 94, three, Russ, maybe four. 94. Yeah. That yes. was in re rehearsal room two. Um, Tipperate days, of course. Yeah. And uh, I think it might be an original Mayhem shirt there. It's actually Russ's, or was Russ's. But yeah, that oh, was, uh, was this uh, was this uh, was this at the same time that that that, that there's a rehearsal? Uh, one of you uploaded, I think, around this time. Uh, yeah, was this photo around, from that session. On that time, if not, maybe that that exact time. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. If anybody hasn't seen that, it's like kind of pre second hour. Oh album. yeah, it's it's on uh, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, and this one, I don't know what you think about this one, Russ, but this is a cool photo. Uh, yes, <laughs> it was cool. Uh, that was, yeah, probably that, that was the, the, the one and only handmade custom Taylor Dolman apparel mm -hmm. designed by uh, Mr. Mr. Equitant there. Yeah, I've got one in uh yeah, one one of a kind. Oh yeah, wow. Th those are the days I was experimenting with shamanistic type of uh makeup patterns and uh I I, I think I've somewhat succeeded in the uh the forehead region there, but yeah, it's a it's a very uh, rare photo. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, most of these photos I took from the uh, from the Absu uh, 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 what you, uh, social Facebook. social media pages or whatever. Yeah. So now this one's, oh, uh, yeah, this was this was cool. I don't know where this this is a cool. I like this one too. Where was this? That was in a uh, room one, the first rehearsal room again with Dave and, um, of course, Russ and I. Oh, that's Dave in the middle. Yeah, that's the, yeah. Oh wow. Dave in the middle, yeah. I, I thought think that was uh, I thought that was Chris. <laughs> I think we're holding can uh, candles. I think so. Yeah, candelabras. They were yes. wall mount candelabras. Yeah. Yeah, it's an oldie. So that, that particular photo session, that was a kind of a Absu Equimanthorn hybrid session. Uh, 
I think the initial intent was to shoot photos for the Equiman Thorn project at the time, and they kind of they kind of metamorphosize into Absy shots. So it was a it was a two in one affair, <laughs> something in that nature. <laughs> I guess this one would fall in that same category, right? And that's definitely Equiman Thorn. Yeah, right? those were yeah Equiman Thorn on on purpose photos. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the, the yeah, the, actually, I think this was this the one that made the. Wasn't there a photo on the on the uh, first first album? Or I can't remember now. It's been so good. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, same session. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, somebody mentioned Equimanthorn earlier. Is, is that something that's just completely just in the past, or do you, uh, pretty, pretty much? I, I laid it to rest after okay. two thousand and eleven. So. I don't think. Well, you never know. <laughs> well, there you go. For whoever asked, there's your answer. Yeah, I don't know if we'll re revisit it ever again, but yeah. lots of releases. So there's yeah. lots out there. Yeah. Uh, oh, this right here. You guys did this. I think you guys did it. It was a collaborative thing, right? The zine. Oh yeah. Yeah. How many issues did you do of this? Uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just this one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, because it was very, very time consuming. And that one alone was 100 pages, which was a little too much for that time. But, and uh, wrapping it up towards the end, we'd, we'd started writing Tip Breath. So it was, we had no time. Yeah. That one alone took so, so much time just to do, just, you know, waiting for interviews, laying it all out. And, and mailing them, you know, it's hard work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, we, uh, but, we did a newsletter after that, but that was that was pretty much the end of it. We just became yeah. too busy with the band. But it was, uh, it, was fun. it was fun doing in the beginning. The entire issue is available online, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. It's for sale at the bikemontanist.com, you know. Yeah, there you go. I Digital, know, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And we also did a book version of it a few years ago. But yeah, it was cool for back then, you know, the early days. Yeah. Now, this piece of uh, my buddy, uh, I just wanted to show this. My buddy's, my buddy Kerry sent me this photo. This is actually oh, yes. uh, in his in his possession now, I think. I think. So uh, he sent me that today. He was like, because well, I had asked him to send me the photos or whatever. So uh, if anybody wants that. Well, Carrie Morgan owns about half of what I used to own. So, uh, <laughs> I fun it off to him. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he is, he is, he is, I, I mean, uh, I've always, you know, been a fan of Absu, but Carrie is like just, you know, everything, anything Absu related. He has like four copies of each, you know, it's just like, He's that he's that insane. He, about, yes, about yes. Uh, Mr. Morgan is definitely the number one contender as the commissioner of the Abporium. For sure. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let, so let me get a couple questions and, I'll, and, I'll, and uh, we'll, 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 we'll finish this off because I know I said I would ask a couple of them. So. Uh... <clears throat> Damn it! Was there? I didn't know. Was there a video you guys had made for the song Absu? Not that correct? an official one, no. Okay, no, no. somebody asked something about maybe it had been scrapped or something. I don't know. No. Uh, okay. Uh. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm. They. They all popped up so quickly. I kind of lost. No, you're fine. Track of them. <laughs> so. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's. Oh, here's something. Uh, <clears throat> Proscriptor, can you recommend us three books, not including the Book of Law and Psychotropic Substances, to understand Absu's magic at its entirety? So. Uh, yeah. Um, there are numerous texts by uh, the three following. There are actually more than three books. So what I'm going to do instead is recommend three um, paranormal 
uh, novelist slash writers who have a multitude of text within their um, their credentials. That would be Kenneth Grant, Dion Fortune, and Austin Osman Spare. So those are the top three writers that I would uh, highly recommend. And uh, honorable mention to is Israel Regardi as well. Yeah, here's one for you, Ray. Uh, I guess it, the contacting uh, the Zimio guys was, uh, you guys, I know you guys have been in contact since, you know, early 90s or whatever. Uh, you, uh, oh, yeah. Ergo wants to know story about he contacted you for the sleeping under uh, Tartarus, Tartarus, Baphomet in 92? Well, we'd, we'd already, I'd already done the Baphomet. It was kind of a, a shared piece of art in between yeah. both Zamil and uh, Absu. So it was a, a union type of piece of art, really. But yeah, we'd been in contact for a long time, early 90s. We've had yeah, the they, uh, of course, you had the absolute demo. We traded back and forth merchandise, shirts, you know, photos. It was endless. So, yeah, yeah it's basically a shared piece of art. Yeah. So if, oh, for those, uh, somebody asked about Magus. If, if this this episode will be available immediately on YouTube on replay after it's done. So uh, we kind of kind of went into that a little bit. So, you know, kind of go back and, and, and rewatch. And also uh, talked about the cover songs like Transylvania and all that. So uh, if you missed that, then just check out the uh, check out the replay, and, and you'll be able to catch all the all the. We don't. I don't want to like repeat stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, okay. So this has been brought up twice. I was trying to. I, I, it's been probably twenty years now already, uh, but people seem to keep bringing it up and actually I already know where this is going but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, exactly, I'll, I'll, I know exactly where this is detouring but go yeah, ahead. yeah 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 so uh but uh John Verica who was actually the guy that recorded the uh the video uh at, that I started the show with uh, at the wetlands in, in New York City but uh I'll put his up since it's the last one up but the uh, whole Slayer tryout thing mm. Well, uh, so Bostoff was out the door, and at the time, uh, Mr. Lombardo was filling in for their tour, and so Slayer held auditions for a new drummer in three cities in the U.S. Only three cities, which is surprising, kind of ironic at the same time. Those cities were San Francisco, uh, Peoria, Illinois, out of all places in Dallas, wow. Texas. So um, this was post Terra. It was uh, in February of 2002. Things were in dormancy stage, very stagnant stage during Absu. And so I auditioned and um, so did other drummers. And I strongly feel that it was a psychological ploy to permanently bring. Dave Lombardo back into the band, but hey, uh, it was a it was a terrific experience, and um, I knew that there were going to be very dictatorial yet tyrannical consequences if I were to join. But uh, you know, I uh, I tried out, and the stipulation was I could only bring my pedals and my sticks. I couldn't bring any symbols. I couldn't reconfigure or just. Vinnie Paul's kit that I was utilizing at the time. And so I had to use Vinnie Paul's symbols and I broke two of his crashes and uh, <laughs> wasn't too happy about that. So, Hey, that's all I can, that's all I can tell about it. It's been on YouTube for uh, yeah, no. 13 years now and um, great experience for a, a huge influence of, of mine as well as Absu. So, so mm -hmm. yeah. Well, especially up to Rain and Blood. After that, it's not much of an influence anymore. But uh, yeah, right. you know, show no mercy through Rain and Blood, definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. I mean, I, I didn't want to bring it up because it's, it's, no, it's okay. 20 fucking years now or whatever it's been, you know. So, But, you know, people still want to know. So Yeah, um, of course. So there you go. 
There you go. Uh, all right. All right. So speaking of the uh, uh, where'd it go? Let me share this real quick. Anybody that wants uh, all information on Apsu, go to the Apsu.us website. And there's everything on that on that site. It's uh, very detailed. Uh, so everybody go check that. I'll put the links and everything in the description after after uh, 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 this is over and I'm able to. Uh, and then also the uh, let me remove that one. So if you want any type of uh, I guess uh, absolute apparel. Uh, Go to the Black Montanus website, which I'm pulling up now. Please bear with me. So I'm just one guy. <laughs> so correct. Yeah, that's it. Here we go. So if you haven't been on this website, uh, you can get uh, probably every Absu design, every Absu related band design you could possibly get. Uh, that you'll get anywhere. Uh, so and more, and more. There's uh, uh, other bands I've seen like Necrovore, Bloodspill, uh, you know, Equitant, uh, Proscriptor shirts, and uh, you name it. So if you haven't been there, go check it out because uh, I think uh, I don't want to bring Kerry up again, but he's probably probably bought everyone on there <laughs> by now <laughs> if he if he hasn't already he's gonna yeah more scream shirts there's yeah, more he, shirts on there too. quite a few <laughs> yeah. he's a dedicated customer That's what he yes does. he is so uh he's a legend yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's a legend. I, I, a legendary I up, customer i grew up with the guy so yeah uh, total total 100 uh, percent comrade just a uh True, true warrior, indeed. Hey, there he is. I don't care. I are. have the shirt raised there wearing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, we 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 grew up. We grew up. Uh, I was going to share the carry story, but uh, I, uh, uh, his little he he knows what I'm talking about. But uh, well, gentlemen, this has been an absolute pleasure. I uh, appreciate you guys coming on, uh, spending. Uh, two plus hours with us. Yeah. Um, thank you. Was, yeah, Thank was, you very much for the was, opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. And I will say that uh, before I depart that uh, in the latter part of the summer, early autumn, uh, I will have some very volcanic earth shattering news, which will be oh. supplemented in a press statement. So um, all of you Kudro clan Absu followers out there, uh, keep your eyes and your ears peeled because I have massive atomic volcanic news that I will catapult upon Earth. Latter part of the summer, early autumn. Just letting you know. So there you go. To, to be announced. All right. So fucking exclusive right here for yeah. you guys, man. Yes. Fucking exclusive. <clears throat> so uh well, oh yeah. So I, I was gonna see if uh, you guys is there other than that atomic uh, atomic news coming. Uh, anything else you guys would like to add before before we end it? Uh, not know. really. You covered the uh, merchandise, and it's really all I'm up to at this point these days. <laughs> oh, most importantly, which I know Francis. I didn't mean to cut in, but I think this is rather uh, prominent and very very important, which Francisco can totally relate to, but. Uh, the Paraguayan label Black Death Antiquarium oh, yeah. Records will be releasing a Absu tribute titled The Immortal Sorcerers, a mythological occult metal tribute to Absu. It features 21 bands all across the globe, uh, featuring uh, Francisco's uh, interpretation of the Winter Zephyr. And I'm just uh, putting the final post-production mastering touches on that right now. It's been... Uh, it's been very meticulous yet tedious work because um, I'm dealing with not just an album, but 21 different recordings. So it's been quite a strategic balance to to get it all leveled appropriately, but uh, about to wrap that up in a day or two. So that's something that uh, we're honored to 
to uh, have this tribute in our names and uh, very much looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely slipped my mind because uh, the last thing I ever talk about on here is about my band. So, <laughs> well, I, I, so I, beat you, I beat you to it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's I, if there's there's uh, uh, that's going to be cool. Yeah. So it was it was cool that. Uh, uh, the, uh, Sorry, I can't remember his name, but he contacted me about about doing a song, and uh, we said, "Well, fuck yeah, we'll do it." So, cool. uh, that's gonna be cool. So, <laughs> yeah, everybody look out for that. Um, yeah. All right, so we'll end it with a Carrie quote. That's gonna be placed in the Morgan Museum of the of the Sioux for sure. So. <laughs> yes, it will. Uh, yeah, it's the Ab Abporium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's located in Nevada. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the ever moving location. Well, actually, yeah. he's been there a while now. But yeah. anyway. again, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Yes, uh, thank you it's, very it's much. Been a, it's been a complete honor having you guys on here. Uh, Thanks, man. So, appreciate it. Uh, I will close the show here shortly. So, but uh, if you guys uh, need to go, uh, just you can go ahead and, and go, but if if you can stick around for like two minutes, and I'll kind of, uh, oh yeah, do my. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll get with you guys. I'll get with yeah. I'll get with you guys shortly. So again, right, cool. thank you right, very cool. much. It's thank fucking you. awesome. Very Welcome. Much. Thank you. All right, guys. There we go. That's it. I'm uh, I'm done. Uh, fucking awesome. This is one of the one of the reasons I started doing the show. So hopefully everybody appreciated it. Uh, Tell everybody about this shit and uh, who's coming up next. I don't know yet, but keep an eye out. A bunch of, bunch of cool shit always coming. So absolutely hell the mighty Absu. I'll leave that on there. And uh, thanks for tuning in. And keep jamming out all badass and all that shit. So see everybody later.